Okay, that's me. Um, they say you never correct the chairman, but I'm going to correct the chairman. Uh, I'm not the founder of OSCOM. I'm not paid by OSCOM. I don't have any financial associations with OSCOM, whatever. I just use it a lot to teach hemodynamics. Okay, inotropy and LVF. Who ever thought of it? Well, let's think about it. Inotropy, or myocardial contractility, as a concept is something we all kind of know. We all kind of have a picture in our head of how powerful the heart is, for another word. But whoever thinks of it as a discrete quantity, something you can measure, like everything else in science. And that's a shame, because depressed inotropy is an important feature of many presentations. Obviously, with the acute primary conditions, like acute myocardial infarction, LVF, cardiomyopathy, we automatically think of a, the power of the heart. But much more commonly, we see myocardial depression as a secondary phenomenon, and we see it in everything. Septicemia, pancreatitis, pneumonia, ketoacidosis, snake bites, you name it, it goes on. We cause it a lot of the time. We give antihypertensives, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. We disrupt people's electrolyte balance. We give them anesthetics. Heck, if you want to see inotropy drop, measure it before and after you give propofol. It will scare you. Just to come back to what has been said earlier, the only induction agent we use now in the emergency department is ketamine. Why is inotropy so important? Well, I'm unashamedly going to take you back to your medical school physiology. You learned when you were there that cardiac output was heart rate times stroke volume. So cardiac output times vascular resistance gives you blood pressure. So these two important parameters, cardiac output and blood pressure, depend centrally on stroke volume. And stroke volume depends on three things. Preload, inotropy or myocardial contractility, if that's how you learnt it, and afterload. Fine. Now preload, we also understand. It's the fluid loading state of the heart. Afterload, well, in effect, it's the blood pressure that the heart is working against. But what's inotropy? Well, in a very real sense, that's the power of the heart. Now, Inotropy responds to changes in preload and afterload. These are constantly changing every second of every day. You stand up, you sit down, you breathe in, you breathe out, you eat, you sleep. Preload and afterload are changing. Inotropy responds to that to stabilize stroke volume. If you can't stabilize stroke volume, you lose control of the circulation. So quite literally, inotropy is central to the circulation. Now, the way fluid loading works is a bit more interesting, but I'm going to come on to that in the second part of the talk. How do we assess inotropy? Well, currently we tend to use surrogates of global cardiac function, and these are very suspicious surrogates. We use things like blood pressure or heart rate, urine output, if you can wait an hour, skin perfusion, capillary refill, skill temperature, all sorts of things. Wind direction, you know. <laughs> I don't know, whether that produce wind, maybe. We use, a bit more seriously, and I'm going to upset the cardiologists, we use things like ejection fraction, which are actually banned as terms in our ICU. They are so dangerous. Because all of these are notoriously unreliable indicators of cardiac function even in the hands of senior clinicians, like people with hair this colour. <laughs> when should we use inotropes? A very simple question. Now, if you look at 95% of the published studies on inotropes, it was done on clinical judgment alone. Which inotrope and how much? Well, when I was training, that was easy. It was, you would use inotropes, Smith, when I tell you to, and not before. <laughs> What are our therapeutic targets? Why are we using it, boss? Because I'm telling you to, Smith. 
how do we know when we've reached our therapeutic targets? I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, but we've all heard that. You know, when you're as old as me, you don't understand why we do this. Well, I am that old, and I don't understand it. <laughs> if only we could measure inotropy, wouldn't life become simple? But how can we measure inotropy at the bedside? Well, we developed a formula to calculate the maximum energy output of the heart. It's a technique well known to hydraulic engineers. You measure the output power of the pump. Very simple. But we can do that from data at the point of care. And that energy that comes out of the heart during contraction, which is a function of its inotropy, must appear as some other form of energy in the circulation. And it follows that the heart always contracts with all it's got at that moment. It follows the all or nothing principle. If you, if you pardon the pun, there is no such thing as a half-hearted contraction. <laughs> so that energy goes into two forms, potential energy and kinetic energy. The potential energy is the energy that goes into raising one stroke volume of blood from venous pressure up to arterial pressure, just like lifting up a bucket of blood from the floor onto the table. But it does it in a given time, the systolic flow time. The faster you can do it, the more power you must have. So that's the flow time, the length of systole, if you like. So the work done is simply the change in pressure times the change in volume. And power is the ability to do work, and it's the amount of work done in a given time. If you can do the same amount of work in half the time as the guy next to you, you're twice as powerful, or you've got somebody helping you. <laughs> Potential energy, then, is simply change in pressure times the stroke volume over the flow time. Now, unfortunately, medicine isn't very scientific. We use a very strange units of pressure, like millimetres of mercury. So we have to actually correct that. But I'll show you that in a moment. We can measure stroke volume and flow time using an ultrasonic cardiac output monitor. You could probably do it with lots of ultrasound equipment. This just happens to be easy. So the formula for potential energy becomes that. Now, the bright ones who are still awake will notice that bit and that bit have appeared. That's to correct to proper scientific units like we should be using in medicine. Okay, when we work that through, we find the units for potential energy is joules per second, or the watt, the SI unit of power. So this is looking quite interesting. Kinetic energy, as we all learned at school, for any moving mass, is a half mv squared. Exactly the same whether you're a bullet, a car, or a squirt of blood. The mass of blood ejected in cubic meters times the density of blood gives us weight, and then the formula is that. It looks complex, but it's a half mv squared over flow time. That's all it is. And again, we can measure that velocity using a muscle. So the total power of the heart went into two forms of energy. We add those together, and we get the two formulae put together, and that's the so-called smith madigan formula. And when you work it through, the unit of inotropy is the watt. It is the unit of power. And um, we published that last year in the British Journal of Anesthesia, if anybody wants to uh, go into a little more depth. The mass is not complicated at all. But we use a thing called inotropy index because how can you compare patients of different sizes? There's an awful lot of me, uh, sorry, an awful lot of you guys would be needed to make somebody my size. <laughs> cardiac index, yeah? Well, we use that quite regularly. It's cardiac output over body surface area. And we use this idea of indexing to body surface area extensively in hemodynamics. And exactly the same thing with the smith madigan Index. You just divide inotropy by body surface area, and then we can compare everybody on different sizes. So the unit of inotropy Index is the watt per square meter. So what's normal? Well, we went down, we looked at 250 normal patients at pre-anesthetic clinic. 
looked at a fairly wide age range, slightly more female than male, than you can tell you're in Australia. <laughs> Did continuous wave Doppler studies looking at the aortic valve from the suprasternal notch using an OSCOM. What did we find? Well, your mean inotropy index is around about 1.8, a range from about 1.4 to about 2.2. Inotropy index decreases with age. If you're under 35, it's about 1.9, uh, sorry, 1.87, 1.9. If you're over 50, it's about 1.7. So guess what? As you get older, your heart gets a bit weaker. Maybe that shouldn't come as a surprise. <laughs> And very usefully, there's no difference between the sexes. So from that, we could define what's normal, which is around about 1.6 to 2.2. Let's say about 1.8 is normal. So then we looked at left ventricular failure patients, because if we've got it right, they should be down for power. And sure enough, we looked at 83 patients with LVF, according to New York Heart Association criteria, and we measured their inotropy prior to any intervention. So these are like virginal patients. We did exactly that with the OSCOM, looked down at their suprasternal notch, measured their blood pressure and hemoglobin. We fed that data into a laptop computer program that we did for us to calculate inotropy index. And lo and behold, what did we find? Well, now the mean inotropy index in these patients is way less than 1.8. And in fact, the highest we got was 0.97. How long did it take to do it? Because if it takes forever, it's not very useful in the emergency department. Well, it took less than four minutes to get that data, but we'll show you something extraordinary in a minute. But this is the best bit. Not one patient in the LVF group had an inotropy index above 0.97. Not one in the normal group came anything below 1.35. Completely diagnostic, complete separation of the two groups. So, if you want to diagnose LVF, measure their inotropy. So, the first part of it, the conclusion, we can do it. We can do it at the bedside. It now takes less than one minute, as we'll show you. Inotropy index is significantly lower than LVF. And we can use it to guide therapy. Now, if anybody is having trouble sleeping, uh, let me know. I'll send you the PDF version of this, and you'll be snoring within a minute. <laughs> it's not a bad read. And that came from our unit, so we get a big gold star for that. Now, this is one of my colleagues uh, pretending to be a doctor. <laughs> uh, down here in a moment is one of our nurses pretending to be a patient. What you're going to see, I hope, will shock you. This is inotropy measured in real time at the bedside. Stop counting. See how long it takes. He's looking down at the suprasternal notch. There's the flow coming through the aortic valve. There's the inotropy index being measured on every single beat of the heart. Job done. So we can do that in 20 seconds. Quicker than you can do an ECG, we can tell you much, much more. But what about volume resuscitation? So volume resuscitation is practiced in every hospital in the world under a whole load of conditions. But what they all have in common is that they're either trying to increase blood pressure or they're trying to increase blood flow. Now, have you ever noticed that the response of patients to volume loading is variable? Some patients respond, some patients don't respond at all. Some show a bigger response. Well, why is that so? Could it be because of variations in their inotropy index? Because that's what Starling said in 1916. It depends on your myocardial <coughs> contractility, how you will respond to loading. So, let's go back. For the slow learners, this is remission. <laughs> Cardiac output, blood pressure, yeah, we know that depends on stroke volume. And we know that depends on preload, inotropy, and afterload. Where does fluid loading fit in? Well, fluid loading, we think, 
increases BP directly? Well, no, it doesn't. There is no physiological mechanism that underpins that. Maybe when we give fluid, we increase cardiac output. Well, again, there's no physiological mechanism that does that. That's just not true. What actually happens is this. Fluid loading feeds into preload. Preload feeds into inotropy. If, and only if, inotropy is sufficient, then you'll have an increase in stroke volume. That leads to an increased cardiac output. That leads to increased blood pressure. Everything has to go through Grand Central Station here, which is inotropy. If inotropy is inadequate, fluid loading can't work. Now, we can look at starving curves. Now that we can measure the inotropy index, we can actually label these curves. A good healthy curve, a heart failure curve. Now, if we look at what the stroke volume index should be, it should be about there. We get a patient who is loaded up at this point. If they're on a low inotropy curve, their stroke volume index is there. We fill them up with a bit of fluid. Even if we get it perfectly at the peak, we get that much stroke volume increase. Big deal. But supposing we took that self-same volume of preload there and increased their inotropy, not even up to normal, but just up to, say, 1.4, then that same volume will now give us a stroke volume increase, which is much better. Simply put, you can get far more bang out of your buck for using inotropes than you can ever do with fluid. Or more particularly, you cannot resuscitate a low inotropic patient with fluid alone. It's impossible. So we looked at it in patients, 122 adult patients with non-cardiogenic shock where volume expansion is going to be used. We used 10 mL per kilo of fluid as a bolus. And we used a typical shock criteria, any three of those. The observer was only involved in collecting data, didn't have anything to do with treatment. And this was done before any IV fluid was given. We started to measure these and then at 15 minute intervals. And we looked at blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, which is really two times three, if you've been paying attention. <laughs> we looked at cerebral function on a four point scale. Normal or alert, B, blunted or vague, C, confused, and D, do lally, as we call it in Australia. And then we measured the inotropy index, or the, rather the OSCOM did. And the exit criteria were when we were judged to be adequately resuscitated or they went off somewhere else. What did we find? Well, we took our success line as a 10% increase in stroke volume following 10 mils per kilo of fluid. Of 122 subjects, 86 responded to fluid, 69%. 36 didn't respond to fluid. Interesting. And very quickly we realized that what we were seeing was one group here, one group here, that seemed to relate to inotropy. And if we put in the 10% threshold, these are where we want our patients to be, this is where we don't want them to be. And when you look at it, that actually fits extremely well with their inotropy index. Their response is inotropy determined. In between, there's a little group where they're kind of a transition zone. They may be made it, they may be won't. And it seems to be about there. So somewhere with an inotropy of about 1.2 seems to be the critical point. And even when we got the full data, we found that the correlation is really quite strong. These are mean and 95% confidence intervals. And the R squared is 0.90. So this is a very tight correlation. What does it mean? Well, if your inotropy index is above 1.2, then basically you will resuscitate with fluid. If it's below 1.2, then basically you won't. And if anybody likes statistics, there's a chi-square for you. Perfectly simple. So that's off the scale of significance. The SMII values, well, we can tell you now, normal adults, 1.4 to 
LVF patients about there, but very interestingly, look at septic shock patients. These guys are almost in the realms of left ventricular failure. Why do so many patients with septic shock not respond to fluid? It's not because it's all leaking out, it's because they've got a heart that can't respond to fluid. And 89% of our septic shock patients actually had severe myocardial depression. So, the conclusions, we can measure it to the point of care, and it can be quick and easy. Low inotropin means they can't respond to fluid. Maybe we should turn that around. If your patient is not responding to fluid, after they've had a litre or so, stop and think. Why do you think the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh litres are going to magically work any better? They won't. If you've got a good inotropy index, you'll have a good response to fluid. If your inotropy index is intermediate, then try a fluid test dose or a passive leg raise. You can always try it, you can give some more, or give some less, whatever. But just to finish off, people often say to me, it's all very well for some professor to come here and tell us that we should be doing this on our patients, but surely it's too hard to learn how to do this kind of stuff. Well, is it? <laughs> you know what's coming here. This little girl is four years old. The sister here is six. Just watch. What is she looking at with such focus and concentration here? <laughs> well... <laughs> there is a perfect tracing of hemodynamics done by a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Now, they call this game Let's Play Us Tom. <laughs> they don't have a game called let's lacerate each other's pulmonary arteries with catheters or let's thrombose, <laughs> let's thrombose each other's femoral arteries. <laughs> this is endless easy this child's play. If we can teach a four-year-old girl to do this, we can probably teach you guys. <laughs>